Church. Thank you all so much. Well, good morning. Give you a chance to speak. I mean, you've been talking to each other and uh, gathering momentum around here. It's great to have you here in the room. It's great to have those of you who are joining us on the stream, especially our friends at the Madison County Correctional Facility. Isn't it a great day to just kind of get up in the morning when you've had a nice, cool night? I think when I was driving in this morning, the temperature was 51 degrees in my car thermometer, and I thought, no wonder I slept so well last night. Isn't it great? Uh, and then to have the sunshine in the morning. I mean, we get 51 in the wintertime, too, but we don't get the sunshine. So this is fantastic, and I'm excited about this series. I appreciate the way that we got kicked off last week by, with uh, Cooper's message about anxiety. And basically what we're doing is in obedience to this verse in Colossians 3. And I love to see God's fingerprints when we select a series to do, and you're wondering, you know, does God lead in these things? And this week on Wednesday, this was part of my uh, daily readings. It says, let Christ's word with all its wisdom and richness live in you. Isn't that a great word picture to kind of just imagine that the wisdom of Jesus alive in you, not just something you aspire to or can go get off of a shelf sometime, but literally his wisdom What's the word wisdom mean? In the Old Testament, it was called chokhmah, which is, which is basically skillful living. So living every day according to wisdom and the richness that God, and let that live in you. And then, how do you do that? Interestingly, use psalms. We're studying psalms. Hymns, and we just sung a hymn. And spiritual songs, like the ones we sang before that one, to teach and instruct yourselves about God's grace. And then look at the last phrase. Say it out loud with me. Sing to God in your hearts. Now your hearts is the center, your heart is the center of your emotion. And you see, God is a person. He's not a theory. He's not a big cosmic thing. He is a person. He has emotions. It says that God gets grieved. And when we connect with God, we can connect with God on an emotional level. And one of the best ways he does that is through music. He created us to respond to music. Now, some of you are out there saying, Mick, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. That's okay. Interestingly. When you think about what happens to you emotionally when you hear harmony, when you hear the melody, when you hear the rhythm, when you hear the lyrics, there is a connection that happens with you that is beyond just spoken word. Some of you have heart songs, even though Cooper shared his last week and you might have one. You may think that you don't, but you do. There are things that if they came on the radio... Within three notes, you would say, I know that song. I know where it is. I know how I feel when I hear that song. And in fact, you might even remember some event or place it might take you back to that was connected with that song. So I brought with me one of those that kind of connects back for me. And see, you can probably see it from there, can't you? Read it. No, just <laughs> kidding. This one is, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. It's an old hymn. There's actually two versions of it. There is the right version and the wrong version. <laughs> now, the right version is called the Dallas Theological Hymn, okay? And at graduation, every year they sing, well, they used to anyway. I don't know what they're doing these days, but 
it was called the Dallas Seminary Hymn, and every year we would sing this as you're graduating with 400 seminarians who finally slug their way through 120 hours worth of work, and they are ready to sing their excitement. And you know the words of it? It says, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, prostrate fall. <laughs> I was wondering if you would catch that. Uh, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And then the final verse says, oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. And the chorus, when you have 400 voices singing in the right version, where it goes, and crown, aren't you glad that I'm not part of the worship team? <laughs> and it just goes up and down, and you got some voices doing this and some voices doing that. And I literally wept in that auditorium of Prestonwood Baptist Church, thinking that this would be the last time I'd be with those classmates, and thinking of what the words were and the power of these voices doing their thing, and that's exactly what we would end up be, uh, doing. And that day, Chuck Colson was our, our uh, graduation speaker, and some of you know him as the, the leader, the one who uh, created Prison Fellowship and was a henchman for Nixon and then became a very powerful advocate for Christ. And all of that is connected to some words and some melody, some harmony, and some rhythm. And you have that capacity in you. And that's why if you check out your next generation, kids and teenagers, and we have three of our grandchildren turning 13 this summer within six weeks of each other. One of them did it on Friday. And what do they do? They're always plugged in. They, they, I mean, there's some kind of music. When they're not doing something else, there's music that kind of is the backdrop of their life. And we need to sing to God in our hearts, whether you can sing great or not. Just sing to God. So that's what, that's what kind of is this overall what we're talking about in this series. Now, last week, if you were here, Cooper left off with a passage from Philippians chapter 4. And again, we didn't talk about this, but it led right into this week's message, which is heart songs when seeking truth, when you're looking for truth. And here's what he read to us in talking about how we can deal with anxiety. Finally, brothers and sisters, keep your thoughts on whatever is right or deserves praise. And then it says, first on the list, things that are true, honorable, fair, pure, acceptable, or commendable. How do we get to things that are true? We are living in a barrage of truth claims, are we not? I mean, everybody you talk to, they don't just have opinions. They're stating facts that have to be true. There is no middle ground. There is everyone just kind of stating their facts their way. In fact, they would say, you can have your truth. I've got my truth. It's all just relative. There is no big truth. In fact, who was the, uh, who was the guy that put Jesus on trial? And Jesus said that he had come to testify to the truth. And what did Pilate say? What's truth? There is none. The pagan philosophy of the time made no truth claims. They just said, this is the way that we're going to treat you, whether it's true or not, whether it's right or not, or wrong or not. There was, in the Roman Empire and in paganism, just this grand idea. Why? Because the gods of the pagan lifestyle and the gods of the pagan philosophy were just as immoral as human beings, if not more, and with more power. And so there is a uniqueness to the theology and the theistic worldview that there is a God who created everything and to whom everyone is going to be accountable. And we're going to be talking today about Psalm 19. So if you have your device or your Bible, you can open up to Psalm 19. It is called a wisdom psalm, and it's kind of unique in that it's a wisdom psalm that deals both with creation and nature, as well as which we call general revelation, and then it deals also with the Word of God, which is special revelation. And those two kinds of revelation are things that we need to be aware of if we want to search for truth. There is truth that's revealed to us 
by the material world, and there's truth that's been revealed to us by special revelation from God. And this particular psalm deals with both. So when you're looking for truth, Psalm 19 is going to give you some great pointers for how to find truth. First of all, you can find it in the material world. You'll find it when you look up in, the, in Stargaze. One of the first, uh, the very first cruise that I took across the Atlantic Ocean was on an LPD, and I was a midshipman at the time. I just finished the first year when everybody treats you like dirt, and it was nice to be treated by, treated by uh, like less dirt. And then uh, after you get done with your watch, doing whatever you were doing, you had a little free time, I would always, especially at night, go up to the signal bridge, and they had these things, these binoculars called the big eyes, and the binoculars were so big that you couldn't carry them. They were mounted on a device so you could turn around and look with them, and they were so powerful that you could count 12 moons on Jupiter just through these, these binoculars. And I would go up there, and if someone wasn't using them for some other reason, I'd be staring up at the sky and looking at Jupiter's moons and all the other things that were up there. So we can find truth in the material world, and it reminds me uh, of Psalm 19. Let's uh, just go through these first six verses that talk about what we call general revelation. In other words, this is revelation that's available to everybody who dwells on this planet, okay? And it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Now, in David's day, surrounded by pagan philosophy, everybody else would say that the heavens were to be worshipped. They weren't something created. They were objects that you, that you should treat as a deity. And David's philosophy here is very different in that it is saying that they are a creation of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. This is an oxymoron. It is silent speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And night after night, I remember going up on that signal bridge and just looking through there and thinking as a, what was I, 19 years old. As a 19-year-old going, this is big. This is massive. And I'm looking at these 12 moons of Jupiter and thinking, but that's just a very short peering into what is just billions and billions of light years beyond that. And then it says, they have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. That's the oxymoron. That everything around us in the physical realm is speaking to us if we will listen for the nonverbal message that they're giving. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. The sun is not the ultimate God, as it was with many of the pagan religions of David's time. It is a creation of the one who is truly God. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Now picture David. I don't know exactly when he wrote this, whether it was when he was King David, whether it was, it was David on the run and Saul chasing him or whether he wrote it even earlier, and maybe he just kind of had it in his mind from all that time. But everybody knows where David started, right? What was his first occupation? Shepherd. He was a shepherd. What do shepherds do? They watch the sheep at night out in the open spaces. And he spent a lot of time awake, thinking about nothing but what is that? Who am I? What is this life about? And then the other thing that you're always looking for, if you had the night watch, is you're looking for the sunrise. <laughs> and so he would be excited. And he said, it's like a bridegroom coming out of the chamber and like a champion rejoicing to its course. And he's just using this metaphor of how the sun just races across the sky. So what can we learn from it? What can we learn from this speechless communication? Every beginning points to a cause to begin. If you're sitting here right now, and all of a sudden there's a bump on the back of your head, are you going to go like, wow, random is amazing. <laughs> what are you likely to do? You're going to turn around. Why? Because for every effect, there is a cause. There's something that makes that 
happen. Now, if you're under an apple tree, as Isaac Newton was, and all of a sudden the tree bonks you, on, or the apple bonks you on the head, okay? When that apple bonks you on the head, it caused Isaac Newton to say, what happened? And you know something? As he studied that and studied that and studied that, he defined the terms that we now call gravity. Gravity. Newtonian mechanics. Why? Because he assumed that there's a reason behind everything. And if there is something that made this apple fall, then because of that, then there's going to be some mind behind it because his assumption was that God created everything. And let's face it, cosmologists are, they're stuck right now. And they're very speculative. Anybody ever watched this program called How the Universe Works? I have never seen a program with more speculation. And, and it's in their language, but it's subtle because they speak so confidently as though they know exactly what happened with all these bubble universes, all these other things, trying to explain away the fact that all the evidence points to a beginning of this universe when nothing produced something from a naturalist point of view. But we all know that in life, when you get bonked on the back of the head, you know there's a cause. And when s nothing was there, and now something is there, that there must be someone who was able and competent to produce the effect that he caused. And that is God the Father. He created all that is. And you can go back and you can look at the fine-tuning of all the constants that allow the universe to be what the universe is, to produce the kind of elements that would allow for life. All of that, even if you want to just take that natural point of view, none of that could have happened without a designer to fine-tune and tweak all of these variables that have to be tweaked in order to support what we have here on Earth. So every beginning points to a cause to begin. Now, that was the cosmological. Let's look at the microscopic. In the microscopic level, see, David didn't have a microscope. He couldn't go down and look at that. In fact, 150 years ago, when Darwin came out with his theories, all of the smallest things, they just called them cells, right? They called it a cell. Now we know that within the cell, there's hundreds of things going on within those cells. It's not just, quote unquote, protoplasm. It is a lot of mechanical protein building. DNA is sending all this code to, to keep these living things alive. Here's a picture of a thing called the flagellum that's attached to many bacteria. And this thing, it's amazing. Look at the structure that's there. Now, this is just a, a picture of it because the micrographs that they build these things from show these elements, but this is put it into a sense. This thing turns a thousand times a second to propel a bacterium around where it needs to go. And it's all done by chemical reactions, some and the differences between the level of chemi one chemical here makes it flow to this one, and it generates this 1,000 RPM or, or, uh, revolutions per second. It is amazing. Now, where on an evolutionary random events, just kind of falling together, how are you going to get that to work? Because every piece of that is essential to it working. So how did the first time a bacterium used that to get where it needed to go, how did it get there other than if a creator did that? And really, the scientific community has, has not really come up with a great idea to answer this concept of irreducibly complex things at that level. And the level of communication and code that's in the DNA that allows that to happen, all of which tells us at the cosmic level and at the microscopic level that God is there. And he is far more intelligent, far more powerful than any other being to be able to create this, to be able to design it in advance and then speak these things into being. 
Now, another thing that Scripture tells us is that we are accountable for that evidence. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, which I'll read to you in a moment, it basically says, this is so obvious and has been for so long that we as human beings are accountable to God to interpret the nonverbal communication that's been given to us. Romans chapter 1 says, What may be known about God is plain to them, to all of humanity, because God has made it plain to them. How? Because the more you dig, the, more, the further you can look into the heavens and the further you can look down into the microscope, the more and more evidence that we get that there is a creator, that he is powerful, and that he is personal. Because after all, just a force couldn't make the decision to say, for instance, when a cause happens and the person is capable of what producing the effect, there has to be a moment in time when there is a choice of the will to do it. So since there was a beginning, there was not only the power to begin it, and to speak it into being, but there's also the choice to do that, which implies a will. So, God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse every place on the planet has the night sky speaking to them every place on the planet has in most cases access to the microscopic or teachings about those things and we're accountable for knowing god because god is out there shouting silently i'm here i'm here don't forget so, that is what we call general revelation. Now, we're going to look at special revelation. And this is that God has communicated with words into human, human life so that we have even more specific things. And in David's time, it would have been the law. It would have been the story of, of God's dealing with Israel through the exodus and through uh, the promises that Abraham received. The law of the Lord, he said, is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Now, for some of you, and I'll ask you, if you came to a faith understanding of God and a trust in the Word of God, let's say a little bit later in life, let's say after your 20s, or maybe you know, into your 30s and 40s, and you say to yourself, what was it like? not having the guidance that comes from the written word of God, from the special revelation that he's given to us to know what truth is about life. Read the book of Proverbs. The wisdom that's there, it's, it's very clear. And when you follow those things, you find that it is refreshing to the soul. And you say to yourself, ah, that helps me understand the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties of life. It also helps me choose better paths than I've chosen in the past. They are trustworthy. When I put my trust in what God says is right or wrong, when I put uh, my trust in what God says will work better than the things that don't work as well, when I do that, it will make me go from simple to wise. And you'll find that to be true. The perfect precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Now, in our culture, isn't it hard for people to even admit that there is such a thing as right? It's challenging, and it's difficult for us because you don't want to go up to someone and say, you're wrong, but we do have to be able to speak truth in love and convey to people that maybe you can get some help from this thing called God's truth. Because God's truth will speak to those areas that are robbing us of joy, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And see, everything about the one who opposes God is that he wants to make you think, just like 
Eve in the garden that all of God's commands are oppressive and designed to suppress you and oppress you. But instead, the reality is they are radiant and they give light to your eyes. Isn't that a powerful thought? The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And it's, this is the fear, meaning the reverence toward God that's based on the truth of what he's revealed, okay? It is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. You see, the ones that endure forever are different from, you can get decrees from people on the planet who will tell you how to maximize what you can get out of the stock market, how to maximize your ability to take advantage of someone else. You can maximize this and maximize your pleasure and all those things, but those things do not endure forever. They are temporary, and they often end with much more pain than they do benefit. And the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. In other words, they will not only give you a better life, but a life that is more aligned with the character of God. They are more precious than gold. Here's a guy who has been the king, who's, who knows about gold. He's had a lot of it given to him as tribute, if he was, in, in fact, king when he wrote this. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and in keeping them is great reward. That's his summary of this thing that we call special revelation. Now, we have much more than that now. That was in the old covenant era that was all pointing to the new covenant when Jesus would come, when he would come in the future. That this is great as it's written, but it's even better when you get the New Testament included in this special revelation. Now, here's some things about his revelation that he gives us in this special revelation. First of all, it corresponds with reality. When you follow it, you find that what it says is true. And I'm not saying that I can manipulate God and get everything I want in a prosperity kind of sense. I get that much of that is written into the Old Testament. But the reality is when we see wise statements in the Scripture, it is because that is the way life is. God designed us. He knows us. When he tells us to live by the boundaries that he's given in the Scripture, he's doing it out of his love, not because he wants to confine us, but because he wants to benefit us and it corresponds with reality and i can tell you from long experience that when i correspond with god's reality and i pay attention to and follow what god encourages me to do in special revelation it is all those things that david just described and when i choose not to which all of us do including me i find that exactly what he said will be the consequences, end up being the consequences. And you can see it over and over again. It corresponds with reality. Secondly, it accurately, this special revelation that was given in the Old Testament times, accurately predicted specific people and events. If you just think back on it predicted that Jesus would come exactly when he came. It predicted how he would suffer. It predicted many, many things. And because of that, we can look at it and say it was written by someone who was outside of time. Think of Cyrus. If you go into the, the book of Isaiah, it describes by name the guy who was going to release, release Judah from their captivity in Babylon as a guy named Cyrus. Cyrus was 200 years from being born at the time that Isaiah wrote those words. And so it gives us reason to trust what's said because it's been verified by prophetic utterance. And then in the last part of this psalm, he talks about, okay, what do I do with this? What do I do with this special revelation that I have by looking around and realizing God created everything and that I'm accountable to him? And then I have all of the special revelation that gives me wisdom on how to live life walking with God. And then what he says is, it, that 
that moment, that time that he spent, and he's singing this psalm, he comes to the end of it, and he wants to say, now what do I do with it? And that's what we should be asking ourselves this morning. What do we do with this? What is the application of knowing that God created everything and that he's speaking to us through creation? And what do we do with the fact that he's given us written communication in the scriptures? What do we do with it? I love the end of this. He says, but who can discern their own errors? I don't know about you. I need others to give me feedback on my life. I need people who are willing to speak the truth in love to me and say, Mick, that was not good. Now, I got to tell you something. I don't always respond the most joyfully when I hear that, but I need it because this is, this is a great rhetorical question to ask yourself. Who can discern their own errors? And if you think you can, you're wrong. Because we all have these blind spots. We all have areas of our life that are things that we need others and we need God's word and his revelation to point out to us, to remind us that there is a time of accountability coming, or to remind us that there are ways that God considers right and just and good, and there are ways that God considers to be wrong, evil, and unjust. And he says then, and this I love because his first response to that is to confess. Forgive my hidden faults. Not just the ones I'm aware of, but God, help me to find and deal with the things in my life that I haven't uncovered that you know that I need to know. And that's the purpose of God's revelation. is not only that we would know him, but then we would be able to know ourselves because he knows us better than we know ourselves. And then he says, keep your servant also from willful sins. Not just the hidden ones, but the ones where I'm saying, God, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm going to do what I want to do. You know that? You ever been in that place? Maybe you're there now. Maybe you're making decisions and you say, I know scripture says this, and I know I've been advised not to do that. But you know what? I'm going to do it anyway because it feels good. It's an easier path. And if we choose that path, we need to be we need to ask God to keep us from those willful sins. Those are the ones that are almost the most harmful of all. Because not only when I choose to do that, am I crossing that boundary, but I'm cutting off the communication with God that would put me back on the right path. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. The great transgressions are ones where we simply shake our fist at God and say, like that two-year-old, and you've all heard me say this before, you're not the boss of me. There's a little two-year-old in every one of us who looks at God and says, you're not the boss of me. I'm the captain of my own ship. And that's when we're in big trouble, when we're, we're responding to God that way. And then I would encourage you sometime to go to this verse and memorize it. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The rock who gives you the truth and the redeemer who corrects the times when you don't listen. The final kind of revelation is not defined in Psalm 19, but I had to go here, and that's the truth that we get from the incarnate word. The written word and the final was all pointing to the creation points to, the special revelation points to, the ultimate communication, and that's Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, is written to people who had embraced Jesus but were tempted to go back into Judaism. And he says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And he's talking about, talking to Moses and all the prophets and all of this, and he says, that's our heritage but we have something far better now because he says, but in these last days, in the, in the decades right before he, this letter to the Hebrews was written, he has spoken to us by his son. John's gospel starts out with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? 
He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. It's all pointing from the beginning of time when God created the universe and the idea of humanity prior to that, that he had conceived and then brought about, spoken to being, was all pointing to Jesus Christ, who would reveal the fullness of grace and truth, as he's described in John's prologue. So what do we learn from this final communication? That God loves us enough to die for us. You may have said to yourself, Mick, you don't know me. You don't know how evil I have been. You don't know the kinds of things that I've done that, that God could never forgive. Well, think of who, who Jesus forgave. And that's where we get this. He died for the very people who were putting him to death. He died for a man who was next to him on the cross who had done nothing really worthy of going to heaven up to that point, and all he said to Jesus on the cross next to him was, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. No time to do any redeeming works, to prove that he was worthy of Jesus' sacrifice for him. And none of us can prove that we're worthy of, of Jesus' sacrifice for us. It's a grace gift. That's how much God loves you. So you might be sitting here thinking, Mick, you don't know what my thoughts are like. You don't know my addiction to pornography. You don't know my, my history of womanizing, my history of whatever it might be, manipulation. However you may want to describe anything where you've shaken your fist at God and said, you're not the boss of me, none of that prevents the love of God that is still pursuing you. God has overcome the problem of sin and death. That's the other thing that Jesus teaches us. Because Jesus went to the cross, he was put to death brutally. He was, his body was literally filleted before he was even nailed to the cross and hung there to suffocate. And yet, on the third day, he stood before confused, frightened followers and said, here I am, risen from the dead. That great universe is not all there is. There's another whole realm of reality in which God exists. Because he is not, he is not living in the universe. He's beyond the universe. He's as beyond the universe as Michelangelo was beyond the Sistine Chapel. He is the artist. He's not the work of art. And the work of art can point us to God, but it is not God. And God raised Jesus from the dead into the realm of the eternal and promised us that by faith in him, we can also live there for eternity. So what's the appropriate response? As you sit here this morning thinking about how how God has created this heart song that David sung about how beautiful special or, or general revelation is and this world that we live in and how it points to God. And then the special revelation that was in the scriptures in the New Testament pointing to the ultimate communication, which is Jesus and his love for you and the promise of eternal life. So what do we do with that? Repentant faith. So this morning, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, simply say to him, God, I admit that I cannot climb the mountain of your perfection because I am not. I am a sinner. I have failed to be perfect in your sight. But I believe that Jesus is truly who he said he was, that he is God in human flesh, and that as the God-man, he was able and did die for my sin on the cross. And as he was hanging there, he said, it is finished. He had paid the price. And then he rose again, proving that death has been defeated. And place your faith in Christ right now. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, and you've been following him for a while. 
Think about the fact that we still have these hidden sins and we still have these rebellious sins where we are short-circuiting all the benefits that he described, the joy, the fulfillment, the experience of righteousness, simply because we want to be the boss of our own life. And ask God to examine our thoughts and our hearts and to align us with our rock and our redeemer. Would you stand and pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for each person in this room. And you know where every heart is. You know the condition of every soul in this room. You know that some in this room right now are standing at a precipice. At a point where it has been made clear, I believe, by what I've said this morning, by what you say in your word, more importantly, that there is an opportunity here to enter eternity with Jesus by faith right now and to know that that's true. And I pray that if anyone is in that condition this morning where they're standing at that precipice, they would simply pray with me right now and join me and say, I am trusting in Jesus. I know I am a sinner. I know that I cannot enter heaven as I am. I need the cleansing, the forgiveness, and the grace and mercy that comes by faith in Jesus alone. And I am going to trust him, and I want to follow him with my life. If you prayed that prayer just now, Lord, I pray that you would just assure each person in that condition that they can know that they have eternal life right now and be overjoyed by that gift. And God, I pray for all those who have been followers of Jesus, maybe for decades, that they would see the goodness of all that you communicate to us silently and in writing and be willing to embrace the value of that which is gold, pure gold, and align with who you are in everything that we say and everything that we do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.